real estate is a business. Investing is a business. You know, you, you can't wake up in the morning and think, oh, I'm just going to do an investment. Just do it. You know, you have to get into that frame of mind. You do your research. You figure out where does the money come from? How much am I going to make? Um, what are the risks? You plan it all out. But then 99 times out of 100, people who haven't made an investment before will do nothing. Welcome to the Bulletproof Cashflow Podcast. Let's get into the show. Hey everyone, this is Augustino. Americans have more than $18 trillion in their home equity right now. Now, traditionally, getting access to this equity meant that the homeowner has to take on more debt, such as a second mortgage or reverse mortgage or a home equity line of credit. But there are other ways to free up that cash. Now, today's guest understands how to make all that happen. After studying law at Birmingham University, he pursued a career in finance and stock brokering. He then chose an entrepreneurial path and founded Europe's first internet billing application service provider. Now, over the years, he has founded and led companies in the UK, Australia, and the United States in the finance, telecommunications, technology, and real estate sectors. Now, he's on a mission to help own homeowners free cash equity with no interest or monthly payments. He has already helped hundreds of homeowners use their home equity to pay off expensive credit cards, remodel properties, and pay off their college tuition fees without taking on this extra debt. Now, as the founder of Quantum RE, he and his team solve a problem for homeowners by helping them access that portion of their home equity. Now, with all that, I'd like to welcome Matthew Sullivan to the show. Hey, Matthew, thanks for coming on. Thank you, Agostino. It's a pleasure to be here. Excellent, excellent. Now, if you like what Matthew has to say, you can reach him via his contact page at quantmre.com. If you like our content, please don't forget to leave a comment and rate the show. It helps us out tremendously when you do. Finally, if you text the word freedom to 202-410-4202, you'll get our free ebook, The Bulletproof Guide to Finding a Broker. Okay, Matthew, go ahead and tell the listeners a little bit more about what you, you and your team do to free up that equity. Thank you. Well, I think the problem that we solve um, is if you are a homeowner and you have a significant amount of equity in your home, the only way that you can unlock that equity is to go back to the bank on bended knee and borrow money. And you're borrowing money through a cash out refi, a second mortgage or a home equity line of credit. But the only way to unlock the equity is through taking on additional debt. Now, we think that's uh, wholly unacceptable. So what our company, Quantum RE, does is we work with investors who are interested in participating in the potential increase in value of your property. So because of that, we're able to offer homeowners a cash lump sum without any monthly payments, without any interest, and without any additional debt. And that means that you get cash, you can use it on whatever you want, and you've got up to 30 years, in some cases, to um, settle the agreement. And uh, in the meantime, uh, as I said, there's no monthly payments, there's no interest, and there's no added debt. Wow. Interesting. Okay. So so how does this work then? It sounds almost like there's like a, a second note or something like that on on the property, right? Well, again, first of all, we have to separate um, the different ways of financing. And as all of your listeners, I'm sure, are aware, in a traditional commercial deal, you've got many layers in the capital stack. You know, you have senior debt, junior debt, mezzanine. On the debt side, on the equity side, there's um, equity, there's preferred equity, and there's a combination where the borrower can get a share of the appreciation through a shared appreciation mortgage. So for a commercial transaction, there's all of these different types of funding. Now, if you look at a homeowner, a residential owner-occupier, the only thing that they're able to get their, whole, uh, their hands on is debt. So in other words, they can borrow money through a, a mortgage or a, a line of credit, but there's no way for them to get access to the equity that's actually sitting in there. So what our programs do is allow our investors to participate in the potential upside of the property rather than having to lend um, the, the homeowner money. So because of that, um, it's not actually debt. So even though everybody, you, you intrinsically, and we talked about this earlier, you naturally want to think that it's a form of debt, but it's not. And what we're doing is we're taking money out of your equity account, effectively, and moving it into your bank account. Okay. 
Okay. So, so, um, can we go through like maybe a real life example? Maybe that, that'll help clarify for, for some people that might be listening, uh, how to, how to picture this, right? So let's say for instance, uh, Joe and his wife, they have, they have a property, maybe, maybe they are, uh, the value that's $250,000. Maybe they have, uh, I don't know, we'll say 200,000 in equity. You know, they, they, they've been very, very diligent about paying off their, their mortgage and put a big down payment. So how, how would they access that, that, that equity with, with your, with your program? Well, again, the, um, the instrument that we use is similar to an option agreement. Okay. And so what we're saying to the homeowner is in exchange for a cash lump sum that we will give you, which is, which is the option purchase money, you will give us an option so that when you sell your home, which can be any time in the next 30 years, you will give us back our original investment and you will give us a share of the increase in value. We're not going to take a share of the value of the property, just a share of the increase in value. So we get paid, if your house goes up, we get paid by taking a share of that increase. So if we look at your example, $250,000 home, let's say that we were to unlock 10% of the value of the home, $25,000. So when um, you take out the, the agreement, the home equity agreement, we would write you a check for $25,000. Um, and you can use that money on whatever you want. And the other interesting thing is it's tax deferred. So in other words, there's no immediate capital gains and there's no immediate income tax because you settle up when you actually sell the home. So you've got full use of that money. And then let's say in five years time, your house goes up from 250 to 275,000. What we would do is we would take a share of that $25,000 increase. And the way we calculate the share is to say, how much did we invest in the first place? So our $25,000 was 10% of the value of your home then. So we add a multiple to that. And each multiple really depends on where the home is and other underwriting characteristics. But it's, let's say it's normally around three times as a rule of thumb. So we'll take three times that original percentage, which is 30%. And our investors will get back their original investment plus 30% of the increase in value. So 30% of 25,000 is um, 7,500 approximately. Um, I'm not sure if my math actually just, you know. Got That's it about on, right, but, yeah. You know, plus or minus a few thousand. Years. Yeah. But it's that sort of figure. So the important thing is that in the meantime, there are no monthly payments. And if your house goes down in value, we do run the risk of potentially getting back less than our original investment. And that's the thing that really separates what we do from a loan where the outstanding principal amount is independent of the value of your home. Interesting. But I mean, I'm assuming that as a business, you guys are not just taking on every deal either. I mean, there are certain deals that you really have to think about and really decide if you want to take it on to begin with. Uh, I mean, maybe if it's if the population is decreasing, there's no jobs, jobs leaving the area, chances are you guys are not going to do that deal, I would think. Well, I think, yes, and you're right, because what we're doing is we're underwriting the, the property itself rather than the individual's ability to borrow money. So what you're saying is absolutely correct. And because of that, even though we are able to offer programs um, through our investment partners in 30-something states, we're quite um, cautious about where we tend to invest. So even though, for example, we invest heavily in California, it's not everywhere in California. So there are some places where if it's rural California or where the property is difficult to price um, or if we think the property is too value, too expensive. So the higher the value of the property becomes, the more difficult it is to get a, a price fix. So there is a sweet spot um, of properties in each of these states because those are the ones that have the most predictable pricing. Those are the ones that are likely to be most easy to sell. And those are the ones that have the most um, uh, sort of value or the, uh, the most sort of predictable it's easier to uh, uh, pr predict, um, you know, where the value is likely to be. Nice, nice, nice. Now, does this work on commercial properties as well then? 
Well, it does, but let me define what commercial is. So it doesn't work on strip malls or triple net leasing. Um, it does work if you're a landlord and you have properties which are uh, residential properties that are occupied by renters. So if you own the property, then we are able to help you. There are a few other few cases where we can't work with you. If you own the property in a corporation or an LLC, or if the property is owned in a, an irrevocable trust, for example, then we're not able to offer home equity agreements in these situations. But if the property is owned, um, and many people that we work with, many landlords have had properties for years. So many of them have properties where there's an enormous amount of equity that they can't tap into because they're just simply unable to leverage their position anymore because you know maybe they have positions in other properties where they've got you know where they have more leverage right 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 well i mean i think that might be one of the sticking points is that for many commercial people that are listening to this right now they're typically going to be into an asset with an llc uh you know for asset protection for to protect themselves of course uh, but they but they're also in deals with other partners, right? So maybe there's there's a, the the GP and the LP, you know, the general partnership and the limited partnership, and maybe with the with the general partnership, they're going to be in an LLC along with their partner in another LLC, and then they have all the limited partners in their in their own LLCs yeah. potentially. So it sounds to me like for a setup like that, it probably doesn't this this no, doesn't it, work. It doesn't work there, but we come across a, this a lot where the actual owner of all of these individual entities, funnily enough, has in their own residential home, they've got equity that they've been unable to tap into. Correct. So uh, again, so those are those types of circumstances, but also there are many um, landowners or, or landlords rather, who, who do have small portfolios that haven't gone through the process of creating these structures, you know, to protect their, uh, you know, to protect themselves. So they still have the, you know, properties owned in their own name yeah well no i think that for for those types of people right now that have that equity trapped in that asset this can work out great because they're getting the cash flow today from the asset you're they're freeing up that equity and they can they can just throw it into another deal if they wanted to right i mean there's nothing really to hold them back right no absolutely not and the interesting thing again we were chatting about this before uh, before the show is people's perception of equity um and how even though as an investor, I could be willing to leverage myself up to my, you know, up to, up to here um, and buy properties. But for my own house, my equity is sacred. So I'm never going to tap into that because, you know, I don't want to have the personal liability of the loan. Um, so this is a sort of situation where a few hundred thousand dollars could make an enormous difference because that could be the seed capital to get you into a syndicate. That could be the down payment. That could be the money that you could use for that fix and flip. And the ability to keep recycling that capital with no monthly payments attached could become very valuable. So um, I think we'd be surprised at the number of people who, if they look at their own personal situations, um, or they may have you know other properties that they own in their personal name that they have never considered looking at because... And they don't want the burden of those monthly payments attached to it. That's right. That's right. Wow. Now, I mean, this sounds like really remarkable stuff. Now, how long has this this program, these types of programs, been around for? How come I've never heard of this before? Okay, those are two very separate questions. <laughs> that's right. Um, I can answer the first one. Um, the first one really is that these programs have been around for over ten years, so that's really good news. So that these aren't um, fresh programs which haven't been tested. So they've been through a number of iterations obviously the first agreements that came out uh, about 10 years ago were created by a company called equity key based in san diego and they were agreements that were fixed to the house price index so the amount that you would pay back would be a function of the house price index and they've evolved and they've gone through a number of iterations um, really based on the experience that the investors have had over the years and also the homeowners experiences that they've had where we are today there are a number of different programs that vary in duration from 10 years to 30 years that have slightly different metrics in terms of how the investors get paid um, but the amount of capital that is being invested into residential home equity through these home equity um, agreement 
structures it is increasing at a, a tremendous rate. Um, so to answer your second question, um, you would probably hear about them soon. And I think the reason that you and many millions of other people haven't heard about them is because they are just at that point where they are about to become mainstream. So, you know, if we check back in 12 or 18 months time, I think far more people will be exposed to this alternative financial tool, um, really because they need to have different um, ways of unlocking their equity because, you know, the banks are making it more and more challenging. But also there's so much more um, uh, experience and there's so much more traction that these investments have got over the last few years that investors are now far more confident. So the amount of capital that's going into these investments is growing, uh, you know, at a tremendous rate. For sure, for sure. I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, right now with uh, with this, uh, whatever's going on right now with all this COVID stuff, lenders are tightening up. Getting getting a loan these days is is a little bit tougher than what it used to be. So this alternative way of getting your hands on that money uh, to certainly help you out in the short term, anyway, is is a great way to free up that cash. It's just phenomenal. Love it. It is also, but I think they're over time, and I don't know what that period is, but I think then is going to be. Uh, a, an education process that has begun in terms of how homeowners view equity. Because up until now, the only instrument that's been available to homeowners is debt. So because of that, equity has taken on this mantle of being the thing thou shall not touch. It's this, this um, it's a sum, it's this magical number that sits there that you have to preserve um, because the only way that previously you can access that is to go back into the debt cycle, mm -hmm. because the two have been so connected. Home equity equals more monthly payments. Now, the moment you break that linkage, home equity as an asset can start to fly on its own. And I think what we will see over the next few years is a number of different instruments that are available to homeowners that will enable them to capitalize on what is their single largest, most concentrated, non-liquid, non-financial asset, um, and find ways of enabling them to tap into that without the, the burden that, that debt brings. Mm. So, and I think a lot of this will be um, catalyzed by what's happened with COVID. In other words, you've got more and more people now that need money more than ever. And because of that, they need to look at the assets that they have. And for most Americans, I think the figure is something crazy, like 75% of most retirees have their wealth locked up in their equity. Yeah. So I think there's, it's an exciting time because I think there's going to be a number of different instruments that will look at home equity. Because as you said at the very beginning, it's an $18 trillion asset class that is currently untouched. Yeah. Now... Is there, I know, and I know this is not debt per se, but is there a, a way for, for you or for whoever, like, I guess this, this, this instrument to basically quote, call the note or whatever it is to basically force that person to sell, like to basically, uh, they, you have to return the money back to the investors and, uh, they, they demand it. I'm not sure what the rules are for, for this, for this new way of, of doing business here, but. Is there a way to basically force that person to sell their property before they want to? I would say it, it, unless the person has committed a uh, uh, wrong word, unless the person has done something which is a flagrant breach of the agreement, in other words, taken on additional debt, which removes or uh, completely dilutes our equity position, Unless there is something that the, the homeowner has actively done to affect our, um, our, our position in, in the agreement, then as a rule, there is nothing that we can do uh, or nothing that we want to do that can enable us to accelerate the term of the agreement. The whole purpose of the agreement is to partner with the homeowner over the long term and share in the appreciation. And the difference between this and, and a loan is the loan gets paid on a monthly basis, come rain or shine. Uh, it doesn't matter what the value of the home is. It's all about the homeowner's ability to make the payments on that capital sum. 
Now, our approach is partnership. We want to work with the homeowner. We want the homeowner to look after the property, um, to help us collectively grow what is our joint asset and to, you know, to a certain extent. Um, and so because of that, we really don't want the homeowner to feel at any point that there is the ability for us to accelerate and to call that. Um, so that the, the short, short answer is no. Um, in most cases, there is no um, opportunity for us to do something that would significantly affect negatively the homeowner. Nice, nice, nice. Now, is, is there a way then to buy out that partnership then? So let's say, let's say I go back to you and say, okay, Matthew, you know what? Uh, I took out the twenty-five thousand um, dollars. I got, I, I just got a bonus. I want to put. I just want to, you know what? I'll, I'll take you guys out. I'll give you, I'll give you whatever X number of dollars back. Is there a way to do that in this uh, in this contract? And the answer is yes, because that absolutely is in everyone's best interest. Because if the homeowner wants to buy out the agreement, we know the terms of the agreement, which are there's a certain multiple that we talked about earlier, and in some cases there can be a cap. So if the property has significantly appreciated in value, there is a certain cap. So the investor can only earn a certain return on his investment each year. So there is, in every situation, the ability for the homeowner to buy out the agreement. Now, the only caveat in this situation is if the property has significantly fallen in value, then you can uh, sell the home but you cannot buy us out if we were to suffer a loss. And this really has come out um, of previous iterations of agreements where the house price index or the houses have fallen in value and homeowners have said, well, my house is now worth significantly less. So I'm just going to buy the contract back. And the earlier versions of these agreements didn't have any provisions to protect the investors against that. So there is nothing at all to stop you from selling your home there is nothing to stop you from refinancing as long as the investor doesn't make a loss. But if the investor is likely to be in a loss position, then you can't refinance the agreement. Hmm. Now, now, if it were, if the house did go negative, why wouldn't you guys want all that money like right straight away? Like, why, why wouldn't you want that? I'm just curious. Because over the long term, I mean, if you look at any... Um, house price index movement graph over any 10-year period in the United States, in the areas that we invest, properties have always appreciated. So mm -hmm. if you take any 10-year chunk, they've always outperformed. And, and as we know, you know, real estate prices are cyclical. So what we don't want is for someone to refinance us at what is likely to be the bottom of the market. And the difference is we're very happy to work with the homeowner if they want to sell, because then in the spirit of partnership, it's that shared pain. You know, as we're both going to uh, suffer. But what we don't want is the homeowner um, to take advantage of that position to be able to buy us out at a loss. Um, and what we will do is obviously we will invest at every stage of the uh, of the house price um, cycle, and it's obviously in our interest to try and invest as much as possible when it's at the bottom. Um, but those are two different things. Right. No. Wow. It's interesting stuff. Now, generally, how long does it take to set all this up and and to eventually that person to get to get that check from you guys? It can be as little as two to three weeks. Oh, wow. Uh, it depends on the investor, depends on the location or the geography of the property. Um, normally, four to five weeks is the average time it takes. And that's because there's a bit of paperwork that goes backwards and forwards. Um, we do need to have some information about you. So you have to go and find that information. Uh, in most cases, there's an appraisal that needs to happen. So there's a bit of time in organizing the appraisal and getting the detailed appraisals back. But it's normally sort of four to five weeks. But as I said, it can be a lot sooner than that. Wow. You know, it's interesting because I know earlier you'd said that you guys are underwriting the asset more so than the individual itself, right? I mean, you guys don't really look at the individual, but the in individual falls in hard times and uh, they start, I guess they start pulling money out from, uh, or rather using this contract to pull money out and they're unable to, to really cover it. I mean, but then again, you guys, are, you guys have the house as security. So even if they, I guess if the lender takes it back, where does it leave you guys? Or are they able to? Well, I think, yeah, I mean, we do underwrite the person and the property. Okay. Unlike a loan where the focus is on the individual's 
ability to borrow more money. Yes. So the question then is, not so much can you pay your existing debts and obligations, but can you pay your existing obligations and this additional debt? So that's how a lender will underwrite a, a, a person. What we're doing is saying, first of all, let's underwrite the property and how much equity you have. If you qualify, and we can talk about numbers in, in a moment, the next thing is, let's look at you and find out what is your ability to maintain the status quo. In other words, do we realistically believe that you're in a position or based on your, your previous credit score or your, your previous um, you know, uh, history, as it were, um, is it likely that you're going to be able to continue to pay your mortgage? And we just look at very basic things like credit scores and you know, are there any sort of serious delinquencies on a person's credit score that sort of indicates that they're probably more likely to fall into default? But that's balanced against the amount of equity. Now, the more equity that we have in the property, the more secure we feel and the more skin in the game that the owner has. So the more equity and the more ownership they have, the less likely they are to enable or, or to allow their house to go into default because then they're going to lose more. Um, now, in terms of uh, maximums, we if you add the existing mortgage to the amount of uh, investment that we make, that's normally capped at around 70 to 75%. So in other words, if you take your mortgage plus our investment, you need to have, as an owner, you will still retain a minimum of 25 to 30% of the equity yourself. So we are absolutely going nowhere near the sort of 07, 08 um, issues where we're investing and we're getting the homeowner down to, you know, one or 2% uh, equity. Right. So this is, um, and the reason I mentioned that is because a number of people say, well, are you not creating another potential, you know, issue with finance? And again, the important thing here is that what we're doing is we're just moving capital from an equity account into into cash flow we're not increasing leverage we're not increasing the homeowner's debt um, and we're leaving the homeowner with at least uh, 25 to 30 percent equity so those properties historically are always the last to go if there's a financial crisis because the homeowners they want to hang on you know with tooth and nail because they have so much uh, you know, interest, they have so much involvement in the property. Right. Right. Well, conceivably, there's enough equity there to keep them interested and, and not just leave, I think, which is a big thing that happened in 2008. Sure, they put money into the deal. But when when the property value just dropped, that that 1% wasn't really enough to keep them around. Right. They just exactly. they just didn't care. That's why they left the property and just walked away from it. Right. So there's, there's some yeah some big lessons learned from uh, from that financial crisis. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, I'm I'm guessing then do you guys put like a lien or something like that? Like is is the is some is there anyone aware that this that this this document is is out there that uh, yeah. there's a loan on it? And we do, and that's you you're absolutely right. So we register the agreement as a lien on title, and the agreement is registered. Um, as a it's a form of trust deed in other words the language um has some elements of a trustee but obviously it's not because it's not a mortgage it's not a loan but what that lien does is it's a performance deed of trust which means that it protects and notates or, or is evidence of the agreement that the homeowner has with the investor so when the home goes through the sales process we're part of the escrow process and that lien has to be paid off. And it also means that we can be protected against the homeowner taking out additional loans that would you know, dilute or possibly remove our equity position. Right, right. Wow. Interesting stuff. Um, so and then as far as getting the, the uh, access to the cash then, so let's say, for instance, some, someone signs up, they go ahead and do all this. How how long before that person actually sees the cash in the bank? I, I think realistically, as I said, four to five weeks. Four to five that, weeks, sort of just to get that. Um, and again, and that includes um, a, a cooling off pre, uh, period of a few days as well. Um, so there's all sorts of protections. Uh, and again, in most cases, there's no upfront expense to the homeowner. And so this is all very much done on a partnership basis. So... Um, in most cases, we don't expect the homeowner to pay for anything. Um, the charges 
um, that um, are involved are one-off charges, typically three to five percent, um, which comes out of the lump sum that we give the homeowner. And those charges are the same as um, the sort of points that you would get on a, a similar transaction. It's a once-off fee, and that includes costs associated with filing, title, city fees, uh, and appraisal, and, other, and any other uh, transaction fees. So the charges to the home money is a once-off charge that comes out of the capital sum. Wow. Very interesting stuff. I love this stuff. It's uh, very cool. Something for, for people to definitely take a look at, especially if they have a lot of equity trapped in an existing asset right now. It's a phenomenal way to do it. Phenomenal way to do it. Yeah. So th tell me, for the person listening right now, if you had a piece of bulletproof advice for them, what would you tell them? Well, I think this comes from my years of um, being an you know, an unemployable person, otherwise known as an entrepreneur. And the advice that I give everyone is just get the shovel dirty. So in other words, uh, and I think this is the same. Real estate is a business. Investing is a business. You know, you, you can't wake up in the morning and think, oh, I'm just going to do an investment. Just do it. You know, you have to get into that frame of mind. You do your research. You figure out where does the money come from? How much am I going to make? Um, what are the risks? You plan it all out. But then 99 times out of 100, people who haven't made an investment before will do nothing. So in other words, my, my advice is with anything, not just investing or real estate, but just get started. Just, it doesn't have to be the big bang. Just do something that gets you on that pathway because you learn as you go along. And the things that you thought you would never be able to figure out become incredibly clear as you get closer to them. Um, so the advice really is just, just you know, get started, you know, do um, rather than say. Yes, it's very sound advice. <laughs> very <laughs> I, I, I think others will be the judge of that. Right, right, right. No, I, I, I think that's, it's something that, um, you know, it's taken me a few decades to sort of figure that out. Yeah. Sadly, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, me too. Me too. All right, guys. Well, if you want to reach out to Matthew, you can reach him via his contact page at quantmre.com. I hope you got some insight on how you can get debt-free access to your home equity and free up cash for other uses that you might have in your life. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you the next episode. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the Bulletproof Cashflow Podcast. 